Hello everyone, how's it going? Dr. Incompetent here, and I'd like to do a complete beginner's guide to Stone Shard here uh, in early October of 2022 on version 0.8 so that you have a nice up-to-date look at this game. And what we're going to do is start a brand new character and just work so that we can understand the basics and the strategies of the game so that we will be able to progress from the starter town to the next town and then the game will open up on its own and you will have a nice um you know leveled up character that is ready to explore and enjoy the game so when you first start the game there is a tutorial and I highly recommend you do the tutorial because it will explain a lot of things about the injury system, traps, and many of the basics that you need to get yourself going. But what we're going to do is kind of do what happens after the tutorial, which is you begin a character. And it is not Varen, it is your own choosing. So we're gonna select new game. Now the prologue uh, is the tutorial which is what I recommend doing if you've never played before. Uh, and it's pretty brief, and it gets you a, a, a nice look at some features. But we're going to go into Adventure Mode, which is the standard game mode. And you choose a mercenary and travel the world exploring dungeons and fulfilling contracts. Indeed, um, I'm going to be playing on Permadeath Mode. You do not have to do this by any means, but I choose to do it because I like roguelike games. And to make it a true roguelike, it's got to be permadeath, so the stakes are really high, and I will be playing in a style that reflects staying alive uh, and not being able to come back. If you want to play this more as a kind of, like, RPG with some forgiveness, then don't play permadeath, but I'm going to do that, and we're going to launch Adventure. So here I am. The caravan is gone. My leg is crippled. Half my men are dead, and the other half are deserters and traitors. The host be praised. But at least I've got the stone shard. So we're in Osbrook one week later, and the voice acting is tremendous, by the way. And as you can see, the graphics are absolutely sensational in this game. So um, Varen is kind of filling you in on what he found out in the prologue, uh, which I'm not going to spoil it for you, but you know, long story short, bad things, uh, cultists underneath a temple, and he escaped, and now he wants to kind of look into it, maybe do something about it, and he has contacted us, uh, a good friend of his from the past, perhaps, or somebody we worked with him in the past, maybe we're just, you know, work colleagues, I'm not sure. If I knew I had to deal with an entire cult of devil knows what, I think thrice before getting into the whole mess. I'm too old for an adventure like this. He is, like Danny Glover, getting too old for this kind of stuff. Ah, only I could have a good talk with Gwinnell right now. I'd ask him what the hell is going on. I've been doing this for 30 years, but I've never found myself in such a tough spot. It is a tough spot, but it's a nice inn. I need to get back to Bryn. I'm not up to going there by myself. So that's why I sent for you. Do you remember how I helped you out back then? No. Well, time to return the favor. Ah. Damn. It's been so long. Tell me, what have you been up to? So he's calling in a favor from a long time ago. And at this point, um, you can't see us. We're cloaked. This is where you will get to pick who you are. And you can choose any of these different... Um, backgrounds that are available which are basically like starter classes but the thing that's amazing about this game is that even if you pick one of these backgrounds all this determines is kind of like what your preset training is what skills you begin with what equipment you begin with and what your unique trait is uh, as well as your stats um, you'll see that the the stats themselves differ based on who you choose your story will be different too of course because this is like what you've been doing since you met him last or whatever and that will change uh some of the interactions that you have 
Also, if you choose Arna, this will change interactions because uh, she's, uh, you know, a woman. Um, same thing with uh, the Runaway Sorceress. But for the most part, the cool thing about this game is that whatever you start with, you're going to be able to find skill books throughout the game that allow you to train anything you want. So you can be a knight who learns magic, or you can be a reaver, um, you know, who wants to switch to using bows or whatever. Uh, it's all up to you and how you choose to spend your points. So there's a lot of customization, in fact, as the Steam page suggests, endless customization with the characters, and it all depends on, you know, what you choose to begin with and then it opens up from there. You're gated in some capacity by your stats, but you get to put the points in uh, as you go and level up, so you can kind of be a hybrid character, be a specialized character, switch, you know, in your journey, depending on what you like. It's it's in your court. Now, for us, we're going to select um, Arna, and I think Arna is a good starter choice. In fact, in my Let's Play uh, of this, and if you want to watch me do my Let's Play, uh, the link is in the description below. I am Arna in one of them, uh, when I haven't died anyway. And she is nice because she has a lot of uh, survival right out of the gate because she's kind of tanky. Like, I wanted someone when I started, because I'm playing in permadeath, this is a roguelike, I don't know everything about what I'm doing. I want somebody who has some sustain, who is very hardy, and that is her, because she starts out being good with swords, maces, two-handed swords, uh, but most primarily shields, combat mastery, and two-handed maces. So I want a sword and board type character to have some defensive options, because you need that when you only have one life, and you're first learning a game. Now, I'm going to be doing that for this tutorial and you can watch me build up Arna from the very beginning. But obviously, feel free to do whatever you want. If you want to use magic uh, starting out, go ahead. If you want to be a ranger, go for it. You know, there's uh, lots of other good options here. But we're going to choose Arna. She's nice and balanced. And I'll show you what we're going to do to kind of make her more powerful right at the get-go. So I'm going to say Is confirm. So? Interesting. Anyway, enough pleasantries. It's time to get to work. It's time. So here's the deal. I can't walk to Bryn with my leg like this. So unless you plan to carry me, we need a cart. We need horses. Okay. We're in luck, though. While you were away, I had a talk with the village elder. We came to an agreement. We'll do a couple of tasks for them. And they'll give us a cart and two horses. Fantastic. By the way, you can either click continue the conversation or push the space bar to proceed dialogue. Don't worry about the job. It's nothing special. I don't think you need my advice on how to deal with brigands or the undead. The Elder will give you the details. You should go see him right away. No time to waste. Ah, I almost forgot. Here's a map of the area. You need it more than I do. Thank you. You can also ask the innkeeper about local events. He is a talkative kind. I'm sure he'll answer any of your questions. Off you go then. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. So, boom. Now we're in the game after we've gotten past the initial preamble of context and lore to know what we're about. So, let's talk uh, about a few things before we get started. Number one. This is a roguelike, but it's an open-world quest-driven roguelike. So there's people to talk to, it's a living, breathing world, and many of the elements are going to be static. And the elements are so static, in fact, that as I do this initial playthrough and you see me build up this character, your journey will be very similar in what um, kinds of quests open up and what interactions you have in the first town so you can get a really firm foundation. There is, of course, procedural elements to the game and randomness to the game, which makes it a roguelike, but it's also uh, got a lot of fixed 
uh, aspects to it, similar to like perhaps Caves of Cud, Tales of Magile, where you begin in a town and you do quests and the, and the people within the town and those quests are locked, but you know, the, the layout of the dungeons, etc., is random. So you get a lot of nice story in this game and it's fun. And the presentation, as you can see, if you are like me and like, you know, pixelated 16-bit style, highly detailed graphics, it's charming. Now, let's kind of look at the screen and go top to bottom to understand what's happening. So in the upper left, you see it says, talk to the Elder of Osbrook. That's my first kind of quest. You can push J to open up your journal and it will give you your quest log, what quests you have. And from this journal tab, you can also see the map of the area. You can see the reputation you have with the different settlements, okay? Um, and you can see the bestiary of enemies that you've met, but it's not available at the moment. Now, um, right now we only have one quest, and it gives you some log uh, lore right here. It says, Varen, my old acquaintance, has got himself into trouble and needs help. Before we can start on work on this contract, we need to get a caravan together. So he wants a wagon and horses. It's expensive, so we need to help some people out here, like the village elder, to get them. Uh, it'd be too difficult to travel through Aldor without one. Luckily, Varen managed to negotiate a deal with the elder. If we can complete a couple contracts, he'll provide us with a cart and two horses. I need to locate the elder and discuss the details. The innkeeper should know where to find him. All right, so... Always check your quest log because this flavor text will give you all sorts of helpful information about how to do that quest. You can also click show on map and the map will show you, as you can see right here, um, kind of like this is the silhouette of our character uh, in this off white is where we are. We're in the town. The quest is this um, shield icon with the fleur de lis on it. That's telling you where the quest location is. We're in Osbrook, okay? And you can see some of the tiles that are around Osbrook because this is the map that Varen has given us. Now, if we click this, we can make the map full screen. You can zoom in and out with the mouse button. You can move around on the map with the arrow keys. And you can use the right mouse button on the map to add markers to remind yourself of things that you find. And as you move around on the overworld, this map will reveal it, uh, its location to you, and then you will know more about the terrain and the area a and as you remove the fog of war. You can see up in the upper right of the map, there is a legend that explains what the different icons mean. So, for example, right here on Osbrook, the little house with the um, moon by it is a sleeping spot because we can sleep in the inn. It's very important to have sleeping spots because if you're not playing in permadeath mode, you can save your game when you sleep. But if you are, like me, you still need to sleep because you want to change the time of day. So, for example, the shops open up. Or there's also a weariness debuff that you get for being awake for too long that you can only get rid of by sleeping. So you're going to want to rest um, to take care of that. All right, so that's the quest log in the journal. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, I have... Uh, a UI that's very similar to Diablo, as everybody who watches on stream notices, and that's what's really cool about the game, is that it's got, like, just a kind of unapologetic uh, borrowing from Diablo and some of its sensibilities. So you'll see here is my health, this is my energy, um, and we use energy to use our skills. Health is restored um, every nine turns, and it says damage temporarily disrupts regeneration, so as long as you're not getting hurt, you can kind of rest to recover your health uh, by pushing R, and then energy um, also restores, and you can rest to recover it. Then you have your skills on the hot bar below. You have several hot bars you can assign and move through, and they correspond to the number keys 1 through 0. Right now, we already have examined surroundings. I can push that, for example, to look, and this is a terrific skill because look at this. Um, it's guaranteed to reveal hidden traps within vision. Um, so 
you never have to worry about being surprised by traps. You can always detect them, provided you remember to use this ability within your vision. And it also has a chance to reveal secret passages, uh, which is geared around your perception stat. So there's lots of secret doors you can find uh, with that skill, which is great. Then you'll see that I have uh, a backpack icon, which I can either click in my inventory, uh, or I'm sorry, on the UI on the bottom of the screen, or push I to open up, and again, bam, it is the Diablo inventory. You'll see the paper doll for your character with the different equipment slots. You'll see the gear that you are holding here in your inventory, and yes, you need to play Tetris with your inventory in this game uh, and move things around. So right away, you'll notice I'm not equipped with the weapon. I'm in town, so that seems hospitable, but I'm still going to equip it anyway. So I'm going to drag the sword in um, onto my uh, hand here in my weapon slot, and I'm also going to pick up my shield and put it here. You'll see that the character on the screen that represents my own character changes to reflect the gear I have equipped. So if I don't have a sword, I don't have a sword there, and if I do, I do. This is important because you can tell what equipment enemies have based on what they're holding if they're humanoid, all right? So you can kind of see, oh, this guy's got a reach weapon, or this guy's got a bow, or whatever. So that's uh, useful, and I just love games that change the graphics based on your equipment. Now, um, important to note, okay, about your inventory, you can see my bag space looks like this, and there's a button right here that says Auto Sort, which you can either click on or push T, and if I push T, it will rearrange the items in your inventory and just kind of make the most space possible, which is great. You can also push W, or this icon with the uh, interchanging arrows to switch between your two equipment loadouts. So you can have main hand or like main weapon set and backup weapon set. In my inventory, you'll see that I'm equipped with some armor and a sword that are purple because these are starter gear that you get for being Arna the Knight. So she starts with this really nice chest piece and a good sword as well. But, as you will notice, items in this game have durability. So in many roguelikes, there is no durability for items, right? Dungeon crawl, there's no durability. You don't need to fix stuff. But in this game, it's very, very much got a uh, survival aspect to the roguelike that's heavy on treating wounds, on uh, drinking water, on durability for items, on fatigue, on all kinds of elements that contribute toward giving you a sense of like, okay, you know, this is more realistic, like I need to take care of myself uh, as opposed to some other games. So what that means is the chest piece that we start with, you'll see that its durability is in red, all right? I'm just mousing over the chest piece and the tooltip that comes out says it provides eight protection but it's actually losing three of that protection because it is broken it needs to be repaired so i would need to go to um s someone within the town the correct vendor to repair it all right um and it's going to cost a significant amount of money to do that, and we don't have enough at the moment. So one of our first objectives is going to be to repair this so that we have a little bit more uh, hardiness to us. We start with a cloak, and you can see, as like looking at this, the stats that this provides, it tells you it's a worn cloak, it's common, so it gives you the rarity of the item. Uh, and the rarity of items is reflected in a color scheme that you are used to in many other games green blue purple as we move up the levels of rarity or like this one just kind of gray slash white for garbage common item you see that this cloak gives us a two percent dodge chance and it reduces the amount of noise that we produce which alerts enemies it's also on full durability we start with an apprentice cowl that helps us not backfire like critically fumble effectively um and gives us a little energy restoration but no armor like neither of these provide any defensive bonuses they what did they do provide is is absolutely minimal 
And so what you need to know is, yes, I'm a knight, but you are really weak when you start this game. I mean, unbelievably weak. We have to be so careful when we go out and we're starting. We have a pair of shoes that do provide one protection and a shield. And the shield um, provides move resistance. Lots of enemies have abilities that, like, knock you around. And this kind of gives you some um, steadiness so that you aren't knocked around uh, as likely. Block chance means 15% chance to block. Block power is basically, like, it adds to this number which determines how much of the incoming damage that you mitigate with your block if it's available to be blocked. Um... Block power recovery means this blocking, this block power that you have um, is a reserve and it gets worn out over time. So like, for example, if somebody hits you really hard and you block it all, that's great. But if you lose all your block power, then if they hit you again and your block power hasn't recovered, you will not block as much because you need some more time to refill. This makes it so shields aren't just, like, strictly OP. Then you get a 5% counter chance with this, but it does cost you. The number in red it indicates that it's a minus, that it's taking away something. It costs you 1% of your energy restoration, which is negligible. Our weapon um, is purple, which meaning, like, you know, it's an extremely nice, unique item. It does 18 slashing damage, so there's different types of damage that you would be used to in Dungeons & Dragons. Um, crushing, slashing, piercing, things like that, that different enemies will be either stronger against or more vulnerable to. It has armor penetration, block chance again, so like you can it kind of contribute towards your blocking because you can think of it as like, you know, you parry with your sword, I suppose has a 1% a accuracy bonus, but it does increase the energy cost of skills and spells by 5%. We have a ring, which gives you a little bit of resistance and health restoration. Okay, so that's our starting equipment. Now, in our pack, we have water, so you will need to drink in this game. This re uh, recovers 25% of your thirst. Now, in this case, this is a minus, but because it's a beneficial minus, it's showing it in green. So numbers that you see um, in green uh, denote positive changes, favorable outcomes. It also reduces your intoxication when you drink water by just a little bit. This is bread. It reduces your hunger, but as you can see, it makes you thirsty. It also will spoil in five days. So this bread will go bad eventually, but five days is a long time, so we'll, we're not going to worry about that. But it's important to note that some food spoils quicker than others, and you have to pay attention to the spoil rate with your food, lest you run out on your adventure and it spoils on you. You can buy food which does not spoil, like preserved meat, things like that, uh, and it's very, very nice. We have bandages, which you learned from the prologue, help reduce bleeding, so if you get a part of your body that's bleeding, you can use the bandage on it. We have um, a healing salve, which helps injure a body part. So, I'm sorry, heal <laughs> helps injure a body part. How about that? That's called poison salve. No, the healing salve helps heal an injured body part. So, it gives you plus 15 injury treatment and 2% health restoration on a body part. Now, what's important about this is, yes, this is nice, okay? But... Um, the deal with this is it's not going to be a substitute for, like, a heal or a healing potion. That really isn't something that's in your wheelhouse at the beginning of this game at all. And what that means, because we're playing in permadeath, is that we have to manage our injuries very carefully and run away and choose our spots because it's not like, oh, I've, I've lost half my health, let me just use my healing salve and recover back to full. It's not that potent. We're going to see how it actually works, but you're going to learn really quickly, especially in the beginning, you got to be careful. 
we have a bag of money and it does take up inventory space to carry your gold this coin purse um can hold a certain amount of money and then it overflows we have lock picks which you use for lock chest and lock doors now this is our inventory i will say <laughs> as i'm kind of explaining everything to you you can see on the screen itself the innkeeper's wife is like sweeping forever and the innkeeper is cleaning that mug forever and Varen is kind of shifting around things are animated in the game but make no mistake this is a true roguelike and what that means is nothing is happening when i'm not moving so it's one of those games where it's like if i move then the whole world moves and the enemies move and then they stop until i move again and we kind of like don't nothing is happening until i'm moving or acting or using an ability that takes time so i can freely stand here forever and no time is passing okay so that's something uh you know that's always important to remember in these games you have all the time that you need to make the right decision you don't need to pause it this is not real time this is a turn-based game even though the animation might intimate otherwise okay next i want to show you the character screen so i pushed c which on the ui down below you'll see is the next button to the right of the inventory you can click on this or you can push c to open it up just like you would expect and again very very diablo you'll see your stats you'll see your character you'll see your um stat points that we get when we level up you'll see that we're level one we need 500 experience to get to the next level and we have zero then by default it goes to this left tab which just gives you general statistical information about your character your damage resistance your survival your combat your magic this is probably the most important tab which is your health tab so in this game like i said it's kind of more realistic on the survival aspects you have a body that takes damage in different locations so you hurt your enemies in different locations like you could chop off an, an arm or something like that and you take damage in different locations and you will see that there's a health bar for like each part of your body your legs your hands your torso your head and if something is hurt you'll need to use a bandage or a healing salve on that specific part of your body um, and any kind of debuffs that you're getting from the injury will display underneath whatever part of your body is hurt. You'll see that where it says health right here, we've got um, a breakdown where it tells you how hungry you are, how thirsty you are, how intoxicated you are, how much pain you're in. And this is very important. So if you're taking damage, you start getting um, a, your pain will increase, obviously, and when it gets to different thresholds 25 50 and 75 percent it produces a negative effect which just like makes you decidedly worse in a lot of ways so you want to mitigate pain now the healing salve um, is something that can do that uh, but there's better remedies for pain specifically that you can use um, that we'll look at fatigue is like how tired you are and once you get really really tired um, you can barely move, and that's why you need to rest. And immunity is just your ability to resist maladies. Our psyche um, is reflecting your morale and your sanity. So kind of like Darkest Dungeon, you have a bit of sanity and morale. Uh, so you have to worry about your psychological health. Uh, but right now, you're really, really good. You're at 100% for both. Um, now you can look at your traits. We start with the Vow of the Feet. This is the Maiden Knight's starting trait. And it says, for each enemy um, within your vision, receive minus five cooldown duration, minus five energy cost, and you take less damage. So basically this means that the knight gets stronger the more enemies are on the screen. And this is fantastic. Although generally you want to avoid situations where there's, you know, multiple enemies on the screen as much as possible. Because early in the game it's a recipe for death if you try to engage multiple targets. And the effect stacks. So, like, if there's two enemies um, or three enemies, this this scales up. And then here's your bio if you want to read that. I'm going to push escape and escape again to close all of those windows. 
Now, what's very important is you'll see that your abilities screen, which is the next button to the right of the character that you open up with S, we actually start with two abilities. So when you begin the game, you start with two abilities for your character, and you get to choose them among the abilities that your starting character type is trained with from the outset. So, for example, we saw that the knight understood how to use swords, so we can learn any of these abilities on the tree here that are shining, right? So you train these, and eventually you can unlock these abilities, which lead into these abilities. So we have swords. We are not trained in axes. We are trained in maces. We don't know how to use daggers. We do know how to use two-handed swords. We also know how to use two-handed maces. We know how to use shields. Then we get into utility. Um, basic skills, these are not really trainable. It's just telling you what you've got. Survival skills, okay. We start understanding how to make a campfire, but we can learn uh, make a halt, skinning, or, or cauterize wounds, okay. So these are like very nice abilities to either help you survive or help you make money from uh, taking pelts from anim animals. Combat mastery has a bunch of amazing abilities uh, that you can learn. Athletics, okay, we aren't trained with it at the get uh, at the outset. Magic, we don't know that, and we don't know any schools of sorcery right now. So what do we want to do with our two ability points? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into swords, right? And I am going to learn the ability Cleaving Strike. So you have the choice between an active ability, a passive ability, and Blade Maintenance, which reduces the deterioration rate of your weapon and gives you some bonuses, passive bonuses, or another active ability keeping distance. I personally like Cleaving Strike because it can hit three adjacent targets, so I like abilities that have the potential for AoE if things get out of hand, but it's also something that you're going to just use all the time on a single target. Now notice that it basically does 38% body part damage and has a 37% chance to bleed. So it has a 37% chance when you use this to put a damage over time on the enemy, which is extremely powerful, and it gives you a 10% counter chance for four turns for each affected enemy. Um, and it has a passive bonus, too. So I'm going to learn this. You left-click on it, and it says, you're about to learn Cleaving Strike. And we're going to say, yes, please, confirm. Boom. We've done it. And then we could learn keeping distance we could go into shields and we could say i want to learn ray shield or um, i want to learn one of these passive abilities or this active ability breakthrough or um you know moment of retribution but i actually really like in combat mastery seize the initiative so this is an active skill that delivers a strike to the target's least protected body part um so whatever wherever they have the least amount of armor and a successful hit gives you two stacks of seized initiative, which gives you a bonus to accuracy, a bonus to counter, you fumble less, and your, schools, uh, your skills cool down faster. Moreover, you afflict the target with initiative loss, okay, which negatively affects those same stats, so they are less likely to hiss, hit you, less likely to counter, more likely to fumble, and their skills take longer, uh, longer to cool down. So I love this ability. Um, and what I always want to do in roguelikes, as you've seen in my Tales of Magile guide, um, uh, or even CUD for that matter, I want as many active abilities as I can have, because in this game, your abilities go on cooldown. Let's take a look at that. Seize the initiative. In parentheses, next to seize the initiative, it has a number 10. That is the number of turns it goes on cooldown for. You can see it has a range of 1. Um, you can target an object or a subject, if it's a person. Um, it takes 13 energy, and it has a cooldown of 10. Let's go back to our sword skill that we learned. This has a cooldown of 8. It has a range of 1. It takes 13 energy to use. Very similar. Just faster cooldown than seize the initiative. But what that means is I can't just cleaving strike all the time. I can only do it, and it goes on cooldown. So I want as many abilities that I can use to give me bonuses so that I can cycle through them 
and avoid having to do just generic hits, which are fine, but they don't give you any bonuses. So I'm going to learn Seize the Initiative. I'm going to say yes, and then it goes down here on my hotbar. So now we have Cleaving Strike, and we have Seize the Initiative, and we've used all our ability points. Now, of course, you don't have to use the same skills. I just like these starting out. I think that they give you a great amount of damage output and some survivability as well. All right, fantastic. So now we uh, can look at the journal tab, except we've already done that. And then over here um, in B, you'll see that this opens up modes and actions. So you can drag like rest um, or shout or attack or reload onto the hotbar and i'm actually going to drag shout right here and reload right here rest okay um allows you to go into rest mode um if you want uh and attack mode allows you to do that uh, go into attack mode but um you can rest by pushing r and you can go into attack mode by pushing control so i'm not going to put those on my bar but you can if you like now, skip turn is always important in roguelikes. You can do it with numpad 5 space or click the hourglass. And then the game menu, these gear icons, you can get to by pushing escape or the button here. Okay, so um, the last thing I want to mention about the UI is you'll see in the lower left there is a log that explains the combat information and everything that's going on. So you'll see, like... When I used Examine Surroundings, it goes in the log. And when I changed my loadout by pushing W, it went in the log. And again, it does that. Now, I will mention that when you change your weapon loadout, it does take a turn. So, if an enemy is adjacent to you and attacking you and you want to switch weapons, they're going to get a hit on you while you switch. And now it's time to move around. So, I'm moving around with the arrow keys, but you can also click to move with the mouse... Uh, whichever you prefer. Now, it says this game um, has a save system, right? Um, and it explains um, how you can use the save system uh, if you are not in permadeath mode. But here, um, our saves are irreversibly erased on death, which means, um, you know... When we die, it's all over, which is expected in permadeath. But what's important to note that this is something that's happened in the game as it's evolved over time. You can save and quit at any time in this game. You don't have to use a bedroll. You don't have to be at a campfire. You don't have to be at the end. You can just push escape and save and exit, even if you're in permadeath mode. And you'll come back and you'll be ready to go. All right. So they said talk to the innkeeper. I'm just left clicking to move around. And you'll see when I mouse around... It shows you the square where I will end up, and the dots indicate the path I will take to get there. And if I mouse over the innkeeper, you'll see that he becomes highlighted, and there's a speech bubble indicating I'm going to go talk to him. And he says, welcome to our tavern. Now you get some dialogue options that you can click on or push the corresponding numbers to use. Um, gold is always like, if the text is in gold, that always goes to the, what they're selling. Then the green here um, matches the saving thing, and this is like, I want to run a room, which allows you to save the game. Now, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to um, purchase this day by day. So I'm going to do it uh, for 15 crowns. You could do a week if you wanted, and that's fine. I'm just going to do it for a day. Now, um, if we do it, he says your room is upstairs at the end of the hall, and he also tells you, which is why I'm renting the room, that you get a chest to put your belongings in. So um, your things will be safe there, I guarantee it, which they will be. So th this is very important to get a storage chest because your inventory space is extremely limited in this game. I mean, unbelievably so. And what that means is you're going to want to offload anything that you want to save, but you don't need to use right now in your storage chest. So I want to have access to it for doing exactly that to optimize and maximize our inventory space. Now, beyond that, you could say, what are you selling? And it opens up a shopping screen, which you would expect. So you can like um, buy food and drink from the innkeeper. Note that he is selling brandy. Okay, that will come up in a moment. And like, let's say I wanted to buy this flatbread. If I left click on it, 
I start to pick it up, and then if I drop it into my bag, I will purchase it, or I can just hold shift and left click it to purchase it, um, and I can bounce it back um, and sell it back to him. But the interaction that I just did was not a resell. That was me buying it at full price and selling it at half price and then buying it at full price again. So don't do that. I just did that for the demonstration of um, showing how you can buy and sell items with shift click, but um, you are not reselling. Once you buy it, you've bought it. So be sure that you're paying attention. Now, you can sort what items are visible by different category types if you wish and we're good to go with that screen I'm going to go back to talking to him and I'm going to say I have some questions so I'm going to push number three and from here um, you can get information about where the elder is about the village lore about what's going on in the neighborhood the people here the and story about the tavern so this is one of the really cool things about the game which is there is a lot of lore that you can pick up and learn by talking to people and i'm not going to actually read the lore to you in this tutorial for the um sake of time i'm going to let you do that on your own but i will say if you talk to the village el like about the village elder he shows you where you can get him um which is very close by we'll look at it in a moment tell me about the village and then I'm just going to talk to him about everything, and I'll show you that uh, once you do this, you can talk to him about who's living here, and he'll tell you, like, every single vendor in the town, what, where you can go uh, to buy different types of items. And this is extremely important because um, anything that's made of wood, for example, the carpenter will sell it to you. And like bows and shields and, and stabs and things like that. The blacksmith is for metal stuff, heavier equipment. Um, you know, there are plenty of people that sell food. The tailor does lighter armor, clothing, belts, um, and you'll see. And then there's an herbalist for medicine. Their job determines their inventory, but it also affects how much they will pay for certain items, so you want to sell your goods to the appropriate vendor to maximize how much money you make from them, okay? So you can talk to them about, like, each person and where they are and, you know, what they do just to get information if you want. I need to talk about something else. Um, and you can talk about the tavern's name, and he gives you the story of the tavern if you want. I'm just getting all of the story, and I say, interesting... And then you can say, have you heard anything interesting? And this is something that you want to ask as many people as you can. Because people in town, if you ask them about anything that they've heard, any rumors, anything interesting, they can actually tell you about locations on the map to go and explore. So um, that is certainly something that you want to do. Now, if you push Alt, it will highlight all of the items within the screen that you can interact with okay so like there's a mug right here that's shining so things that are items that are interactable also have little sparkles that are on them to show you that like hey you can interact with this and if i mouse over it um you'll see that i can actually pick up this mug and you know not be stealing but if i were to try to take this bucket you'll see that the glove or the hand icon turns red, which means that is stealing, and you don't want to do that unless you want to aggro people. Go in this barrel, that is stealing. Don't do it. Okay, but you can use this. If it has a gear, um, that means that you can use this cooking hearth. Now, if I click on it, it's just going to turn it off, um, and that's left-click. I can turn it on and off, but if you right-click on it, um, you can cook... Or extinguish using that menu okay now I'm gonna go up actually let's not go up the steps let's talk to the wife and you can see what she's selling and actually everybody in the game almost in the town will sell you stuff but if they're not a vendor their inventory is really really limited like they don't have very much money they might have one thing so it's only good for vendors generally um, now you can also ask her about saving the game and you can then ask her about anything new and um, she tells you about what's going on this year 
and then I'm going to go upstairs. Now, when you go up here, you'll see we're on the second floor, and he said our room is at the end of the hall. So this is our room right here, and this is the chest that you can use to store your items. You open it up, and you can just shift click things to put them in there, or just drag them in and out as you wish. Um, I'm going to keep everything I've got on me, but this is what we can use. And then you can click on the bed to rest, and if you do that, um, you can rest, okay, um, for the day that you've paid. So we've only paid until midnight, so we can rest until night if we wish. Um, and you can buy more time to rest uh, to whatever time of day you'd like. Then you can go out here and uh, not take the apple, but you can talk to uh, Rickard, who is like a mean noble. You can just get their information about what's going on here, about Osbrook and what's going on with the story. And he's mean, and he's a jerk, and we don't need to talk to him anymore. All right, so now let's leave the inn. And we're ready to roll and explore the town. So we get to Osbrook, and you'll see immediately that we can only see within our vision a small part of the map because we haven't explored. I can hold down Alt, and there's nothing to interact with item-wise, but there is a hunter sitting at the table, which is rare. Um, he's not always here. He moves around, so when you see him... He's always worth talking to. And then there's the town drunk. Let's talk to the hunter first. And Bran um, basically explains that he is uh, the, the hunter. And you can say, how long are you staying here? And he'll stay for a couple of days. So he's going to be here for a couple of days. And we can buy from him um, a bear pelt, some deer antlers, a dead bird, and some death stingers in a jar. He also sells a trap. Now, the bear pelt is good. You actually need this for a quest, but it's far too expensive. We also need the deer antlers for a quest, uh, and we could buy them from him if we wish, but they're also, you know, rather expensive. Let's talk to him again. Uh, who are you? He's the poacher. Very nice. And can you teach me something? And check this out. Some people, if they have the can you teach me dialogue option you can learn skills from like ranged weapons or athletics and it's 250 crowns to do that so we could definitely do this if we wanted to I'm not going to do it right now because in the first dungeon we're going to find skill books and we can use those but this is certainly something to keep in mind, especially if you have a particular build that you're going for and you find him and you're like, yes, I want ranged weapons, go for it. Um, and hunting advice, here's the most important one. Respect the woods, be patient and focus. Very nice, thank you. Um, now, the one thing I want to say, um, he says he goes to Manshire, which is the next town, which we're going to try to get to at the end of this tutorial. And then... Um, he says there's a cabin in the woods he's been using. It's a long trek, but if you don't mind taking it, feel free to stop by. And we are then going to leave the conversation. And we're going to scroll out, and he did not mark where his cabin in the woods is, but it's in the woods. Now, I'm going to go talk to the town drunk, and Ram says, Good day, uh, young man or lady. I can't tell from here, and... If people have a quest, you can talk to them for work. So th the main quest is like, go talk to the Elder of Osbrook. But something very important to note about this first part of the game is that many of the uh, named villagers in the town have tasks for you to do that are a great way to earn some rewards and money. So, for example, if I ask him about work, he's like... Um, he basically ends up saying uh, that he wants brandy. And so we say, deal. And then we say, you know, our quest changes. It says, find a bottle of brandy. Well, we just found out that the innkeeper sells brandy. So let's go here, and we can buy brandy from him. It is expensive. It's 90, but it's worth it to complete this quest. 
So we got the brandy. Now, one more thing um, that I want to show you before we leave is talk to Varen again. You can do this right away, by the way. I'm just doing it at this time. Talk to Varen again, and then remind him about the ring that he talked to you about. I remember you mentioned a ring, um, and he's like, oh, I did. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> and um, he gives it to you, and he explains what it is, and boom, we have a ring now that's a magical ring. And it gives you, um, you know... A little bit of bonuses which aren't that great but it's free and you have an empty ring slot so take baron's ring and put it on your empty ring slot you can equip two rings and so we get a free ring out of the deal beautiful now let's go out here and talk to our man and now that we have brandy you can say i finished your task and he's like what and he says, take this trinket to remember me by. And he gives you an unidentified amulet. And we say, confirm. Cool. Good luck. So he gives you this amulet. Now, this amulet is unidentified, which means um, you can put it on, but you won't know what it does. And it won't, I believe, give you any benefit until you have identified it. So we need to find a scroll of identification to do that. And to do that, we need to explore the town. So let's look around. So once we move south into the village square, you're going to notice that immediately there is a blacksmith sign right here. You can look at it. Uh, your cursor will turn into an eyeball, and the sign will indeed highlight yellow, and it says smithy. And there's the blacksmith, and you can go over and talk to the blacksmith, J-Bar. And what's important about the blacksmith uh are a few things and let's go through them number one you can say what are you selling and it opens up the screen for buying and selling with the blacksmith but what's important about this is to remember that these are the types of items that he makes and sells okay weapons primarily and if you have weapons to sell bring them to J bar unless they are weapons that the carpenter buys and sells. And you'll take time to just kind of figure this out. But what you can do um, is mouse over an item in your inventory. And in the bottom right of the tooltip, it'll show a gold coin icon with a, a value. And that is how much this particular merchant will pay for the item. Okay, so when you're not in the merchant screen, you'll get a value of the item. But that's not how much people will pay for it. That's kind of like almost how much it sells for. And right now, uh, you get much less when selling things than what the item is actually worth. And you wanna pay attention to how much you'll get for an item, okay? So for example, he would give me 65 for my sword. Now, over here is what he is selling. And when you mouse over one of these weapons, it will allow you to um, compare the damage of your weapon uh, and all of the stats to what is on sale. So you can see on the left box it says War Scythe, and then on the right it has your equipped item for easy comparison. Now, this does more damage, which on the surface looks good, but this is a two-handed sword, so we wouldn't get to use our shield, uh, and that's the sacrifice, you know, more damage for less protection, and we don't really want that at the moment. Now, this shows you how much money he actually has, 827, which you'll see in coins in his inventory as well. Again, you can sort the items he's selling. These are caltrops, um, which you can use to kind of drop down and uh, have enemies walk on them as you lead them to a location or run away. And this is a bear trap that uh, a claw trap that you can use on people or uh, when trying to catch an animal for example you just have to lead them over it and then they sell lock picks here where you need to come and get more and they're very cheap which is great so you can get another set but um, as you'll see you have three of three charges but they only are used up on the lock pick if you fail the lock picking attempt so as long as you're successful with your lock picking you have these, so you don't need to carry around two sets. At least I don't recommend it, but you could if you really wanted to. Now, the final thing I want to show you is that there is this anvil icon. And this says repair metal items. So whatever 
type of item this guy specializes in, this merchant specializes in, you can repair it. So if I click on this anvil, it'll turn my cursor into a hammer, and then it will highlight the weapon or armor or piece of gear that I can repair. Now, I can't repair my shield because it's at perfect durability. It's, it's at full durability. I can repair my armor, but you see that it's going to cost 459 gold to repair it. So that's why it's so expensive. It's one of our early priorities, but it's good to know how much this costs, but we can't do it right now. So I'm just going to right click to dismiss the repair icon, and I'm actually going to push escape and stop trading with him. But let's talk to him again. And I think it might be worth your while to check out the other dialogue options. So if you say, do you have any work for me? Um, he says he needs to get a bunch of swords for the guards. So what he basically ends up saying is he wants three weapons, cleavers, falcons, and simple blades. And he needs three, and he'll pay you more. And so you want to accept this deal and say, yes, I'll do it. And you get a new quest. Many of the people, just like we saw with the town drunk, have quests for you to do. Some of them are easier done than others. This one is particularly easy. Once we leave the town and start fighting brigands and ruffians and things, they all have weapons and they all drop them, and you can come unload them to get credit for this quest. Additionally, um, you can ask them specifically, like, what kind of goods you're looking for, and he'll tell you what he's going to pay more for. Um, and what about weapons and armor? And he says, um... I bet pretty much all you have is like broken down junk that I'm not going to give much money for. And that's true. And this helps you understand what you should prioritize. So a lot of the weapons that you find early in the game do not sell for very much at all. And they take up a lot of inventory space. Um, so, you know, he'll buy it if it's in good condition. So try to find magical good condition items if you can. Um, but for the most part, you know... A lot of the things that we we find, it, it might say it's worth a lot of money and it might be really interesting, but you're not going to get very good resale value for it. And you just kind of have to learn what is worth your time to haul around and sell. Um, you can also ask him anything new around here and he gives you his piece of information and then you can ask him questions about the area. You can get lore about the village and himself if you like and we say good luck. Okay, so now this is uh, Margit, and she is selling food. So you can buy different kinds of food from her uh, that you can use for cooking or use to eat if you like. And you can also uh, ask her if she's seen anything new, um, and she talks about thieves. And yes, thieves are plentiful on the road, especially at nighttime. And this is Gina, and you can see what she's got. And she's got fresh fruit and some uh, alcohol to sell. Now, she is also selling water, but never buy water in the game. You don't need to. You get it for free, okay? Fruit is fine to buy. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's pretty cheap, and it doesn't spoil very quickly. But it doesn't provide much sustenance. And you can get stuff like this been foraging outside. I typically never buy anything from these people um this guy up here ormond um sells raw meat um which you might find a use for if you cook um but again i don't really buy stuff with him uh, at all i tend to buy um items that are already cooked and prepared like bread uh or preserved meats and stuff. Now, this is the town well, and you can see when I mouse over it, I get a gear icon, and you can go over and click on it, and you'll just drink from it, and it will restore your um, thirst indicator. You can see it went back down to zero right here. Um, I'm already starting to get slightly hungry just walking around, but the most important thing about the well is this, okay? Um, you have a water skin in your pouch, and if you want, you can right-click on the well and select Collect Water from the drop-down menu. And then it will turn into... The cursor will turn into like a bullseye or a crosshairs. 
and you want to target your water skin and left click on it and it will fill it up now we can't do it now because it's full but this is how you fill up your water skin for free and get free drinks from the well you can also do this from like the river uh, or a, a water source in the wild okay and let's just keep exploring let's uncover the fog of war on the town all right and moving over here now let's go down and you'll see there's a sign with a saw. This is indeed the carpenter. And let's go talk to the very nice carpenter. By the way, he's not nice. Um, but we're going to talk to Jerg and he's going to be complaining and complaining. And then he gets into his bit of story and you can see what he's selling. So he sells shields, okay, bows, arrows, bolts, and also some uh, maces. So if you have some more wooden equipment come bring it here sometimes it can be confusing on what goes to the smith and what goes to jerg the carpenter but just test it yourself to see what sells for the most and you'll get an idea he repairs wooden items um so if you have things that are made of wood uh that need fixing this is your guy i come here to buy bolts and we'll talk about that in a moment oh wait wait jerg come back i need to ask you can you teach me something? Um, and he can teach you uh, his way around an axe. Um, you'll have to pay me, and we don't have enough money right now. Um, and then you can talk to him about him being not fond of the Elder to get some lore. And then you can ask him about goods, and then you can ask him if anything is new around here and get again more information about the game and the, and the area and embedded within a lot of the dialogue with people which i'm skipping through for the sake of time with the tutorial is generally some helpful tips and tricks if you're interested about the game things to be on the lookout for and here is the tailor hold and um he's like a misogynist and so you know you can just kick him in um well wherever you want to kick him and just get on with your day with doing business with this jerk and what we're going to say is um do you have any work for me and he wants you to hunt a bear and so you can get this quest to like get him a bear pelt this is a very difficult quest. I don't recommend that you try to do this with a new character because killing a bear is quite challenging. But if you have money and you can buy the bear pelt that you need for the quest from the hunter, that's another way to go about doing this if you wish. Um, but I think some of these quests will get them, but we don't intend to actually complete them because of how challenging they might be, especially in permadeath mode. There's no reason to risk your life uh, for some of these quests, but you want to get as many of them as you can because... Some are quite easy, and they provide you a little bit of extra money uh, and get you reputation and other favors within the town, so they're worth doing. And what are you selling? And he actually sells all kinds of great stuff because lots of your slots, like gloves, boots, helmets, uh, cloaks, he can give you. He also sells um, a throwing net, which you can use to um, immobilize big things for hunting or for crowd control and so you know this is a great place to come if you've got extra money and you want something like a belt because you can buy this belt it's pretty cheap and then you will have something i don't even have a belt right or i could buy these gloves um and they give you four protection they're too expensive but um i could buy these bracers for example and get myself to protection to make myself a little bit stronger okay and so that's a consideration of something to spend our money on early is just filling out some of the gaps we have in our inventory okay and we're going to go around down here and let's just go due south in the town and we'll find the uh, herbalist who you can talk to him and you'll see that the herbalist sells not only plants that he gathers around that you can use uh, for various effects which are listed on the tooltip, but he also sells all the medicine. So you can apply leeches to yourself, which is, you know, um, something 
if you really like leeches. Uh, but the main thing you want to buy from him would be splints to set a broken or very, very injured body part. Um, you can use healing salves always. Bandages are fantastic to have around. And then, um, honestly, antitoxin or um, other items that will cure poison are very worth considering. All right, so... Um, this gives you pain resistance, so you could pick out what medicine you want, but your main things are going to be healing salve and bandages early on. All right, now he also has work for you, which he wants you to gather plants. Um, and so this is actually a pretty easy quest uh, if you know where to look, and the plants are very close by, and it's, it's definitely worth our while to do this. And you can ask him if there's anything new, and then move on. So now... We have talked to the herbalist, who is down south. We've talked to the carpenter, the tailor, the blacksmith, okay? And we need to move up here and talk to the village elder. So the village elder is in this uh, rather large house here where the town guard is. So when you come into this facility, you'll see that there is a guard sitting at this table and some other guards just kind of playing cards and generally not helping. This guy, though, talk to him immediately because he basically says that he's been instructed by the village elder to give you an item of your choice to help you. And for this tutorial, for my suggestion with Arna the Knight, you should take a ranged weapon, all right? You could take a one-handed weapon, but you start with a good one-handed weapon. So I think you want a ranged weapon, and I'm going to take a crossbow, not with any particular uh, reason, but I just like... Uh, the crossbow it, it's what I generally pick and you get it right here and so he gives you like a terrible crossbow and some really bad bolts but they're actually pretty valuable at this stage and this is extremely important to get in my opinion because you'll see enemies from far away with this character type and you can't really do anything to them until they get to you and so this just gives you an, a way of softening up your target from range you will be very inaccurate it'll be a miracle if you hit but when you do hit it hits hard and you can make it so that enemies are much more manageable so i like to have it plus it's free so what you want to do then is just switch to your backup weapons set here on your character panel and then pick up your crossbow and put it in your hand, and then pick up your bolts and put them in the quiver. So now you're ready to go with a crossbow. You can see she's holding the crossbow right here. Now I want to push escape. Now remember earlier when I had you bind, shout, and reloading, just click on the reload icon and you'll see um, the I there's like an animation above her head of reloading the crossbow. You'll hear the sound effect and in the log it says you reload your crossbow. That means you're ready to fire. And you can see right here that the icon for reloading has changed into unloading. So I like to just carry my crossbow around loaded so I can shoot it without reloading. It will take a full turn to reload your crossbow. So it makes it slow to use um, and you have to time it right. But you want to have it loaded to be ready to go. And I'm going to push um, W to switch back to my sword for now. And we're going to go upstairs. And here you'll find the village elder sitting here and working at his table. And he's going to give you some guffaw, and then you can talk to him about contracts. Now, here's the deal. The main quest line tells you to come get this contract from Odar, the village elder, okay? Do not get it. Do not get it right now. Wait. The reason we're going to wait is because it's on a time limit. I believe it's four days or something to that effect. And you don't want to be rushed. You can always come get this. There is no rush if you don't accept the mission. You'll see it has three skulls. This is a ranking of its difficulty. I recommend, instead of accepting this mission right now, simply doing some of the quests that we've gotten around town and leveling up first so that we can become stronger getting some better gear before we go do this, okay? So this way we can rest as much as we need to beforehand. We can grind up and level without any uh, urgency. 
So just be like, okay, thanks so much, and then you can come back um, when you're ready for it, all right? And we can ask him if there's anything new, uh, and then you can get other lore from him. And this is just where he is when we're ready to accept the contract. But I did this mistakenly my first few times playing as I would immediately, you know, I would push J, I would go to the quests, and it tells you gather in the caravan, which is the main quest, and you're like, okay, you need to go complete your contract. I would just dutifully run up to the elder and accept this, and then realize this is too hard for me right now. I need to level up, and I don't want to be on a time crunch. So you won't lose the game. Nothing happens to you if you don't take this right away. So let's just come back and get it later. Let's do these other quests. I think doing Jabbar's quest and doing the Herbalist quest uh, sound fantastic to me. So in addition to doing Jabbar's quest and doing the Herbalist quest, I'm going to continue to just map out the entire town. And from here, what we'll do is uncover all of the people, all of the locations, um, and then make sure that we're ready to go out and explore. Uh, we can talk to her. This is Rona, and, uh, nah, she hasn't heard anything interesting, really. So we say, thanks so much. And every once in a while, some of these people can give you good information. So you just kind of talk to them, um, and you'll either get story or some dismissal or actually good information. And you can buy from them, but usually, they, yeah, she has, like, cabbage, you know, something random like that, like some food that she's going to eat. Uh-huh. And I'm just walking through their fields and destroying their crops, and... He wants to tell a story, and he's got some mushrooms. And there's the outhouse, in case you need to relieve yourself. It's a fantastic, great-smelling place. Okay, let's go here, and this is the stable guy, and you can talk to Anselm, and you can ask him if he's heard anything, and it's usually really bad. Things are really bad, as you're going to learn talking to people. It's, it's very dire times. Osbrook is fallen very very far from grace if it ever knew grace and so your help as a mercenary um is welcome in, in to a degree but people are so used to being let down by incompetent mercenaries hey hey incompetent and you know the terrible town guard that you're not getting the warmest welcome right now all right so now we're walking around and i feel pretty good about what we have mapped out and what has happened. Look, on the upper center of the screen, I have had a... Um, I've gone into a state of optimism, which means I have more fortitude um, and I get more experience. And in general, everything is going really, really well for me uh, because I feel good, right? Remember, you go to your character and you go to health and when your morale is high, you can get into this like positive state where you feel like you could do anything and you're just ready to rock and roll. And indeed, we kind of are ready to rock and roll. I feel like we've got some quests, we've got some ideas of things to do. We already completed Ram's quest, and we got an extra ring, and we now have a crossbow to use that's loaded up and ready to go. You can tell it's loaded by the um, bolt icon in the lower left. And at this point, I think it's time for us to move outside the town. You change zones by walking to the edge where all these arrows are and clicking on them. And we will get into that next time. This is a great place to end the first episode of the tutorial, which is basically understanding what character to choose, how to do character selection, what skills to pick, how to navigate the town, getting all of the quests, not accepting the elder's quest, getting a ranged weapon, and feeling ready for exploring by making sure that we have a full water skin, we have food, we have um, a bandage, a healing salve, some lock picks, and are cooking with gas. The other thing that would be nice would be there is another merchant we need to kind of pop into this stall, uh, but he has not yet uh, spawned in our game. 
So we're going to have to kind of wait for that guy to come to see if we can buy an identification scroll. Um, if he's selling one, but he's not, and he's not in the inn yet. So we'll wait for our buddy once we get back from successful forays. And that will be what we do next time. We'll learn all about combat, and we'll start to explore, fill in our map, and look for the plants for the herbalist and the weapons for Jabbar, as well as just try to get enough experience to level up at least once. So everyone, thank you so much for watching. This is a great game. It, it does have a little bit of a learning curve, but I hope that this is um, informative for you. Please let me know of any questions that you have in the comments below, and I'd love to help you out. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care.